Hi, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Loretta Mickley, who's a senior research fellow in the Atmospheric Chemistry Modeling Group at Harvard, where she uh, co-leads that group. Her research has focused on chemistry-climate interactions, primarily in the troposphere. She seeks to understand how short-lived gases and particles affect climate, and how climate, in turn, influences atmospheric composition. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty complicated subject. Loretta, thanks so much for giving this talk. Um, thanks. Uh, wait, hold on. <sighs> Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, that's great. Okay, so my name is Loretta Mickley, and I'm honored to give this talk um, in honor of David Rind, who's been a wonderful collaborator. Um, he really brought a new dimension of science to us at Harvard, and we're very, very grateful to his insights, his efforts, and his overall humanity that he brought to our projects. So, um, uh, let's see if I can have a little trouble with the, well, okay, here I am at the very beginning. I just want to call attention to all the names listed here. Many people have contributed to the work that I will pr be presenting. So, um, I've added a few slides as background for those of those people in the audience who may not uh, have much experience thinking about atmospheric chemistry. Um, I'm an atmospheric chemist, and some such chemists work in the field, some work in the lab, and some analyze data and build models of the atmosphere. And I'm in the third category. And I'm showing um, some examples, five examples of kinds of air issues or air um, problems that we investigate. Um, everything from fires showing up the smoke from fires showing up in Boston to pollution in Salt Lake City at the top. We look at smoke from wildfires, um, haze in mountains is full of little particles and gases, and then finally urban smog. And all of these um, constituents in the atmosphere are of interest to our group. Um, and my particular research looks at interactions of short-lived gases and particles in the atmosphere and climate change. And one way we can um, categorize different species or different constituents in the atmosphere is by looking at their lifetimes. Um, some, particularly some man-made gases, last for centuries. Um, carbon dioxide is very long-lived, that's the famous greenhouse gas. Then there's methane, and then down at the bottom, you see what I'm particularly interested in, and that's ozone, which is a, a, a gas that appears in smog, also appears higher up in the stratosphere where it's, a, it's useful for us. I'm not going to be talking about the useful stratospheric ozone today, but the pollution of ozone at the surface. Then there's also particulate matter. Otherwise known as PM or PM 2.5, which stands for those particles less than 2.5 diameter in microns. And the PM is also known as aerosols. And at the very bottom, you see some atmospheric constituents that last only seconds in the atmosphere, showing a, a picture of Hong Kong with some very, very uh, polluted air. And so our work focuses on how to make the air cleaner and what um, can make it worse, what, how does meteorology affect uh, air pollution, and can pollution affect climate. But I want to say first that since 1970, when the Clean Air Act was uh, inaugurated, there have been huge improvements in air quality. Um, and so you can see, for example, Los Angeles, um, while it still has quite persistent um, pollution, it's much cleaner than it was in the 1960s. And then you can also see smog um, just blanketing New York in the 1960s. So we really have to, you know, hand it, uh, 
take our hats off for EPA for regulating air so well, at least up till now. And so there are two key issues in my particular field. One is chemistry climate, so sorry, two key issues in chemistry climate interactions in the atmosphere, which is what I'm most interested in. And what is the climate penalty on air quality is the first question I ask. So I'm showing at the top um, with the bar chart, uh, the number of millions of people who are exposed to high levels of ozone or high levels of those tiny particles called PM 2.5. And this is in the US. And what it shows is that currently millions of people in the US are living in areas in violation of the EPA standards, um, over a hundred some million. And the question is, will these bars change as the weather changes, as climate changes? Um, we know that pollution tends to get worse, for example, on hot summer days, at least on the East Coast. And the second question that I address is, how do trends in short-lived species, those particles or ozone, affect global and regional climate? And I'm showing here some plots I'll return to again, so they're a little complicated. They're showing um, in, in the background, um, particulate concentrations at the surface, PM concentrations at the surface in 1990 and 2001. Um, and you can see the, the air was much more polluted in um, the 1990s over the East Coast than in 2001. Um, we're checking against observations. We have many more observations now in the 2001 plot. And over the bottom panel, I say equivalent to two, minus two watts per meter squared. And what that means is that these particles can cool the atmosphere or cool the ground underneath. And I'll be talking more about that cooling in the coming slides. I'll return to that, um, that effect. Um, just for now, I'll say these particles can act like little mirrors in the sky and reflect sunlight leading to cooling at the Earth's surface. But we'll get to more of that later. So there's some very complicated ways we can look at um, what's going on in the atmosphere. And the top uh, set of pictures has to do with feeding meteorology into a chemistry model called geoschem. It's like a weather model, but has uh, chemical reactions occurring in each of those little grid boxes. And the meteorology in that case comes from uh, observe, observed meteorology, um, satellite data, for example. But what if you wanted to look at what will happen to the atmosphere in the future? You wanted to go back in time and see what the atmosphere was like in the past. We don't have satellites for those periods. And in that case, we depend on, in blue, the meteorology from freely from a freely running climate model, like the model that David Rind was so carefully developing at GIS all this time. And we can take meteorology from that and then feed it into geoschem, the chemistry model. I have some other boxes, land cover model, fire prediction model. I'm not gonna go into all of the, co the complexities here, but this setup allows us to go forward in time or way back in time to the last ice age. Um, but there's a simpler method. I'm going to skip this slide and just go on to the next one. Another way that sort of bypasses at least some of these complications is to develop statistical models to describe the atmosphere. And let's look at the diagram at the bottom. We start with observed relationships between meteorology and air pollutants. So these are functions. We say that particulate matter or ozone, our functions are related to temperature, precipitation, cold fronts, whatever you want. And then once you really understand the past, the observed past, which may only go from 1980 to the present day at best, then you can apply these relationships to future meteorology from IPCC models. And then we can find out how will future air quality appear 
Um, and I'll give an example of how we did that. Um, and if you don't understand all the nuts and bolts of this, that's okay. I'll show results from our work. Um, ooh, here we go. Oh, I should say this first box on the left is very slow, um, takes a lot of care and um, thought. But applying those relationships to the future meteorology is very quick. And then that provides a range of results indicating the uncertainty in our future air quality. So for, as an example, um, let's, let's start with the effects of future climate change on wildfires in the Western US. And we can see the implications for PM 2.5 or those smoke particles. So the top panel shows in red how the area burned uh, evolved over the Southwest due to fires. That's in red, it says observed from 1980 to about 2010. You can see that year to year, there were different fires, big fires, little fires. Um, some years were, had multiple, like multiple fires large area burned, and then we built a statistical model using observed sensitivities to understand how, what drove those changes in area burned. And in blue, you see our model results. So this is totally um, observation based. And this was, this was a very challenging task to do, to get a model to actually show us how fire evolves in the recent past over the Southwest. And then we can take those relationships and apply them to the, um, an ensemble of climate models to see how area burn will change in the future. And I'm showing in the bottom panels um, a, for the, present day 1986 to 2000 and then in the future from 2051 to 2065. And we have observations in red for the present day and in gray represents a range of model results um, for the recent past. Um, they they kind of match in the median which is exactly what we want giving um, some characteristics of those models, which I won't get into here, but we're glad that the, the average works really well um, with the observed. And then we can look into the future and we see that, wow, the area burned, that is the, this marker of fires really changes in the future due to increasing temperatures. That makes sense. Um, because as the temperatures go up, these warmer temperatures can dry out the fuel, making uh, the fires more dangerous, more likely to spread in the future atmosphere. Um, so then uh, we looked at how smoke from these fires could change in the future atmosphere. And we, um, worked with some health people and uh, to see just exactly what will smoke do in the future as fires change. And we found um, in this next plot that many populous counties experience um, 40 to 150% increases in smoke by the 20, just by the 2050s. We also looked at something we called smoke waves. And these are periods when smoke is especially enhanced. And we saw all over California a doubling of these smoke waves compared to the present day. Um, and we also found some health responses to these increases in smoke, which I will not go into right now. The black circles are just the larger cities affected by this. So you can see very widespread increases in the percent change in smoke. We also um, did a similar exercise looking at ozone episodes. Now ozone is bad to breathe and just as PM is bad to breathe. And as I said earlier, the EPA has done a wonderful job of cutting back um, some of the man-made 
uh, precursors to ozone and particulate matter. But again, because uh, temperatures promote ozone production, we see that in the future, um, we expect to have many more ozone days, especially in the Northeast and California. These are ozone episode days in summer. And so now I'm gonna shift gears and go to um, the second part of my talk to talk about something um, sometimes called the warming hole. And uh, let's look at the bottom plot. It's a map that shows the observed spatial trend in temperatures from 1930 to 1990. And so you can see warming in Canada, off to the west, but you see this strange cooling. Um, this is the total change over that time period. Um, the strange cooling denoted by the blue colors in the central US. Um, and that's sometimes called the warming hole because that's where the warming did not happen. When we look at the observed US surface temperature trend, and this is using a, a product that comes from GIS, we see from 1880 to about 1930 or so, we see warming, lots of interannual inter variability, but we do see warming. And then we see again warming after 1980, but you see this middle period where things, if anything, are cooling. And this is a the temperature trend over the whole of the contiguous US, so the bottom 48 states. And the question is, what is going on? And what could this have to do with particulate matter? I, I started to talk about this previously. And we'll talk about it now. I'll give you a cartoon of this, how this could happen. And the question is, did clearing the air of particles inadvertently lead to warmer temperatures at the Earth's surface? So what we see is the sun beating down on the Earth, and we see the sunlight hitting these orange circles, which represent particles in the air. So this is pre-1990 uh, Clean Air Act. So the air is going to be rather full of these particles. So those particles are mainly reflective. That is, they reflect at least some of the sunlight back to space. And that sunlight doesn't reach the Earth's surface, leading to cooling. These same particles can actually act as little seeds for the clouds. So you see a big cloud off to the left. And the clouds can also reflect sunlight back to space. And what does that do to the surface? That means the surface is seeing less sunlight and also it could mean that the soil is more moist. So that's pre-1990 Clean Air Act. It was one of the amendments to the Clean Air Act that, that strengthened the original 1970 Clean Air Act. Okay, but since then we've really tightened those rules on particulate matter. Instead of seeing four particles represented in the atmosphere, you see just two. So there's less sunlight reflected back to, space, back to space, more sunlight reaching the surface. And you can also see the clouds are somewhat smaller. That means there are fewer aerosols, fewer particles seeding those clouds. And that can lead, lead to warmer and drier conditions at the surface. So, we want to clean the air. There's no question about that. Um, these particles are bad to breathe. They can dig deep into your, well, be, breathe deep into your lungs and cause different diseases. But did we inadvertently lead to warming at the Earth's surface when we um, uh, put these regulations in place? And so now I'm showing um, those model results. I showed two panels earlier, going way back from 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, and 2001. And you can see the model tells us that this bloom of red appeared in the eastern US as um, we first 
uh, really um, underwent increased emissions of these particulates. Where do they come from? Mainly from power plants, but there are other industrial sources as well. And then um, we see a big decrease, even from 1990 to 2001. And if we had measurements going that far, that far back, we could better check, but we do have measurements for the present day, and those are shown in circles in that very bottom 2001 panel. So the question is, what are these particles, um, what effect do these particles have on the climate, on the regional climate, underneath at the surface. And for that, we worked with David and we applied um, these anthropogenic particles to the GIS climate model. And I'm showing here in these panels um, trends in forcing. What is forcing? Um, positive values of forcing, radiative forcing, mean warming. Negative values mean cooling. So let's look at the top panel. And I'm showing what are called sunlight aerosol effects, just that uh, effect of partic particles just on how much sunlight reaches the surface. And I'm showing from 1950 all the way out to 2050, we put together a scenario using um, other people's work to figure out what will happen in the future. And you can see there's some warming that's denoted by the gray for every one of those uh, time slices. But there's also very strong cooling, particularly in 1980 and 1990. And the cooling, if you look at the colors, comes from sulfate. And the cooling, this is over, I should say, the eastern US. Um, the cooling means, oh, maybe the eastern US is experiencing cooler temperatures as a result of all the gunk we have in the air. The bottom panel shows what are called cloud aerosol effects. It's the same kind of forcing, so positive, which we don't have any of, would mean warming. So we have cooling in all those years. And this panel shows how these particles interact with clouds. And what we find is that we get a net cooling from both the sunlight aerosol effects and the cloud aerosol effects leading to cooling. We do get a little warming from black carbon. Those are the gray at the top panel, but mainly it's cooling. And we find that the cooling mainly takes place uh, from 2010 to 2020, and then it kind of levels off in, the, in the, both panels. Okay, so now I'm gonna to go to the next slide and we'll show now, not this funny metric radio forcing, but now I'm gonna show temperature change. This is in the GIS climate model, work done with David Rind and our student, Eric Leibensberger, wonderful student. And you can see these are the coolings in, in the surface and higher up in the atmosphere. Um, Due to these particles. So let's just look at the surface air. You can see really strong cooling during this time period, 1970-1990, due to the particles. That's denoted by all the blue. The black dots merely indicate those grid boxes where we are most confident that there really was cooling. And we see cooling over the North Atlantic where the particles are blowing and it's a one degree cooling in Celsius at the surface over the east. Okay, so now let's see, let's zoom in on the US. The top panel shows that same cooling, but just over the US, a so really strong cooling, not unlike the warming hole that we saw previously that, that came from the observations. So this is a model replicating pretty well, actually, the warming hole, um, the observed warming hole. And what's interesting is we see not just temperature changing, we see changes in other meteorological variables. So 
at the bottom left, we see a change in cloud cover. We see more clouds. At the bottom right, we see increasing soil moisture. And if you remember a couple of slides ago, maybe I'll quickly return to it. Yeah, you can see I didn't talk about the soil too much, but you can imagine with less uh, sunlight reaching the surface, you get more moist soils, less evaporation from the soils. Okay, so we see in the model anyway, greater soil moisture, and that could be important for farmers. Okay, a couple more slides. Um, now I'm showing um, a temperature trend over the Eastern US from 1960, oh, a little before 1950, and then out into the future. These are temperature anomalies um, relative to some mean temperatures. And the very noisy thin black line is the observed temperatures. So they just go up to 2010. The bold, the darker black line is um, a smooth version uh, without to smooth out the interannual variability. And then you see two colored lines. The blue are the, are the temperature changes in the model results I just showed you with cooling during the 1960s, 70s and 80s, and then warming as we remove those particles. And then because it's a model, we can go out into the future. If we don't include those particles, we get a different picture. We get a warmer uh, surface over the east that doesn't stay cool. You can see increases due to greenhouse gases starting right away in 1960. So the trend is different. So we can begin to attribute um, some of the temperature trends beginning in 1990 due to, to reductions in those particles. Okay, so, and as time goes on, the red and the blue lines converge because um, the particles are reaching the same levels in both um, scenarios. Okay, I'm gonna close with some newer work that David was not part of, but grew out of this earlier model work. Um, it was very model driven before and we really like observations. And so we wanna look more closely at what observations we have and ask what do the observations tell us about particles and temperatures in more recent decades. And so this top panel shows from 1997 to 2013, something called aerosol optical depth. And that's just a measure of particles in the atmosphere, a column of particles over Illinois. We have a ground-based instrument measuring these particles over this time period. And indeed, we see, as expected, a decrease in the number of particles over that time period. And uh, we expected that, we know the Clean Air Act is at work, but what's interesting is that we also see an increase in the surface sunlight in the short wave uh, wavelengths from, from almost the same time period, I guess it is the same time period from 1995 to 2013, um, at the same site where these um, particles, the AOD, is being measured. And over the time period, we see a 13 watts per meter squared increase in um, this sunlight. That's really large, and that can lead to warming at the surface. And to turn now to some other results, um, I'm showing again model results, but these models are driven by observed temperatures and precipitation, so they're a little closer to reality than those freely running models I was showing previously with the GIS model. And so this work shows that land surface models um, also indicate changes in summertime meteorology from 1990 to 2015. You can see, first of all, an increase in surface sunlight 
just as we saw at that site in Illinois, you can see the red box in Illinois, that's the Illinois site. Um, increasing watts per meter square, that's the measure of sunlight. Um, and this plot shows the trend over time. The next plot over in the top row shows the trend in temperature. That's also increasing over time. We go back down to the bottom row, we see precipitation. That doesn't seem to be changing very much over the contiguous US. But soil moisture, that's decreasing quite a bit. So our question is, are these changes, these meteorological changes, are they signs of global climate change? Are they signs of regional changes due to trends in particles or both? And this is a mystery we're still trying to solve because there's so many forces going on, so many influences in the actual op op atmosphere that it's hard to disentangle all that's going on. Okay, and then I'll close here. I'll, okay, I'll just go through my conclusions. Air quality depends on weather and global climate change may impose a climate penalty on US air quality. We find that a warming climate will lengthen the fire season in the West by 23 days by the 2050s and increase summertime surface concentrations of smoke and decreases in anthropogenic particles due to air quality regulations may impose large regional forcings and may inadvertently to surface warming. And uh, we find that there may be um, a link between particle changes and the US warming hole. And I just want to close with a plot, as so, so long as we're talking about soil moisture, um, I want to sh close with a very early uh, article, paper by David Rind, um, showing a farmer during the um, Dust Bowl and showing um, the first paragraph of his paper. Uh, and it was really an early example of the alarm being shared by scientists that the increases in carbon dioxide could lead to changes in our Earth as we know it. Thank you very much, David. That was terrific. Thank you so much, Loretta. Um, we're going to turn it over to David to ask um, to get us started with our question and answer period. And once again, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to head over to the group chat and type your questions in there. Loretta, thank you for that great, very clear talk uh, on such a difficult subject. Uh, my question is a tiny little bit of a non sequitur, but depending on your answer, I might have a follow up question that will be more closely aligned with this talk. You showed uh, briefly, uh, I believe, a picture of ozone um, locations in the US. Uh, I, I guess the question I have is, uh, in addition to the work you've done, looking at the effect of the change in the Clear, uh, the Clear Air Act produced on particles, uh, presumably, did it also pro uh, produce a change in ozone concentrations over the U.S.? Yeah, I kind of swept through that at lightning speed. So let me go back. There we go. Is this the plot you mean? Yes, exactly. Um, yes, so each of those dots represents a site where we measure ozone. And we found that ozone episodes are very sensitive to uh, the daily maximum temperature at most sites in the US. Um, so we're looking at ozone episodes only right now. We've looked at other um, influences on mean ozone, but for this particular study, we just looked at ozone episodes. All those black triangles are places where our model looking at maximum temperature did not work. So those are just black triangles. Um, I can talk about those black triangles if you want, but in any event, 
just looking at the maximum temperatures and how they will change in the future based on IPCC uh, projections, we predict these changes in ozone episodes in the future, assuming, assuming that the precursors stay about constant. Great. So, I'm sorry. So, my follow up question is that um, if the uh, increase in pollution, uh, the decrease in pollution led to a decrease in particles and therefore more sunlight hitting the surface and an increase in temperature associated with the decrease in pollution. What this picture seems to indicate is that um, pollution will also lead to greater ozone episodes. And maybe it also led uh, to greater ozone episodes before the Clean Air Act like really went into effect in 1990. So if that was the case, and if there had been more sort of high ozone episodes in the eastern US, ozone in the troposphere is a greenhouse gas which produces warming. Right. So maybe the Clean Air Act might have produced more warming by reducing particles, but maybe it also produced a little less warming by removing some of the ozone. What do you think? Yes, that's a very nice point. Okay, so what David is asking is that um, these particles that act like little mirrors and reflect sunlight back to space, they tend, most of them, tend to cool the surface. But as David is pointing out, ozone has a different property. And in the troposphere, the layer of the atmosphere in which we live, it is a greenhouse gas, just like carbon dioxide, and it can warm the atmosphere. So did we have opposing, did we uh, uh, impose uh, different uh, influences on the atmosphere by decreasing ozone um, through the Clean Air Act? Did we actually lead to cooling? Is that your question? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, we, we may have, however, in the global atmosphere, one of the big drivers, one of the big uh, precursors of ozone is methane. And methane has not been decreasing. It has not, it is not regulated. It has not been regulated historically by the Clean Air Act, although there are some efforts now to control its emissions. Um, and methane has been increasing quite rapidly. Methane is long lived, it hangs out in the global atmosphere, and it's making most of that tropospheric ozone around the world. If we could cut back methane, then I would say yes. If we really decrease methane appreciably, we could have a cooling that might counteract some of the warming. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so basically what you're implying is that the Clean Air Act didn't mm -hmm. really in itself have a big impact on tropospheric ozone because it didn't regulate methane. That's right. That's right. You said it much better than I did. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, so we have another question from Rosalba in the chat. And the question is this. For students using a sun photometer to measure AOT, three wavelengths, is there a way for them to determine if the air pollution that they're measuring is mainly caused by anthropogenic or natural particles? Oh, that's a good question. I think it would depend on the wavelengths. And um, I'm, let's see. At three wavelengths, I mean, if it's, it, okay, it could be, um, if you get the same um, absorption at, across three wavelengths, you can think, oh, it's black carbon. And if it's smoky, it comes from a fire. 
and I suppose that's natural. Yeah. Um, so the natural sources, quote unquote, in the US are fires. Um, you can get biogenic aerosols um, and they would be hard to distinguish. I'd have to think about that. It depends on the wavelengths, um, but that's a good question. You might be able to see smoke from other sources, but I don't know if you could distinguish biogenic um, secondary organic aerosols easily. I just don't know offhand. It depends on the wavelengths. So there's a clarification in the, in the chat. It says blue 465 uh, nm. That's nanometers, right? Blue, yeah. blue 465 nm, green 540 nm, and red 615 nanometer. Oh, I don't think you, no, I think you'd have to get, no, I don't think you could. That's my, that's my view. Um, but I would, I'm not, not an experimentalist and so I, but I would have to think about that. I just don't know that you could. It's very hard for anybody to distinguish between um, natural and anthropogenic PM. It's quite challenging and I don't think you could do it with those wavelengths. That's my view but I could ask. It's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Rosalba says, thank you very much. Um, if, are there any other questions for Dr. Meekly? Um, we can give it another minute in the chat. I think there's, did you want to say anything? Okay. Um, so I, I think, I think if there aren't any other questions, um, we're gonna wrap this up. But if you do have further questions, please feel free to email me or Rosalba, if you wanna email me to um, ask uh, Dr. Mickley any further questions on this, um, let me know um, and I can connect you too. Um, and we just wanted to say thank you so much to both Dr. Mickley and Dr. Petit for their presentations today. Um, it was really very informative. Um, and we're so excited to have you as a part of this series. Yes, and Loretta, thanks so much for giving this talk. Wonderful talk. Oh, thank you so much. It was a delight. And David, we miss you very much. Yes, well, let's interact some more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Loretta, if you could just stay on for one second. Um, everybody else, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>